Welcome back. This is Professor Bolduc, and today we're going to talk about enzymes. So before we begin uh, or go into further depth, let's first give a definition of what enzymes are. Okay, we're going to begin by saying that <clears throat> enzymes are proteins. So because they're proteins, they're going to be subjected to, to all the conditions that can harm these proteins. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. But these proteins are going to be very large in general. They're going to be large, we say that they are also globular. Now globular means that they're going to be sort of roundish, they're going to have sort of some shape and some uh, formation on, some, some shape all on its surfaces. These shapes, and they're going to have different charges. They might have a little bit of negative charge here. They might have a little bit of positive charge. This shape and charge is very important for its activation or its, for its activity. All of these large globular proteins that we call enzymes are going to be responsible for chemical reactions. Now, what are these chemical reactions going to do? They're basically going to make or destroy. You can also say break. Make or destroy chemical bonds. Usually these chemical bonds are going to be covalent bonds. So chemical bonds. This serves as the basis of metabolism. That should be an M, metabolism. So this structure is to precede that of our metabolism lecture, and this, we're going to talk more about these enzymes. So in general, when we refer to enzymes, we usually call them, as, we call them catalysts. What the term catalyst means is a, a substance that will help speed up the rate of a chemical reaction. So alone, these chemical reactions can occur, but it may take a lot of time. It may take you know, hours, years, centuries. But the minute you add a catalyst into the mix, then that catalyst, in this case an enzyme, will speed up the rate of which that reaction will happen. And so let's see how that what we talk about. So we're going to say that these chemical reactions can be can take two forms. One, uh, they can make a chemical bond between two molecules. So you're going to start as two molecules and end up as one larger one. Or these chemical reactions can also destroy the chemical bond. So we're going to start with one large molecule and break it up into smaller pieces. So in both of these cases, what we're, e we're doing is either making or breaking a covalent bond. So it's going to require energy. So as we show you in this graph, we start with those molecules that we begin with, we're going to call them substrates. By either making or breaking that bond, it's going to require a certain amount of energy before that reaction can occur. Now, this red line shows the energy that's required in the absence of a catalyst or an enzyme. So we're going to call that the activation energy. So the activation energy without the enzyme. Notice that there's a lot of energy there. This arrow, the, the difference between, or, or the distance between these two dotted lines is greater than if we um, had the presence of an enzyme. This, this is to illustrate that without an enzyme, it takes a tremendous amount of energy to align the, these two molecules together if we're going to make a covalent bond in such a way, uh, because these two molecules have, have electron clouds around them. These, uh, electrons are negative charge, they're repelling each other, so we need some amount of force in which to put them together so that they now share the electrons and make this covalent bond. Likewise, if we're going to break a bond, these shared electrons are orbiting around two particular uh, atoms at this time, but we need to stress it in such a way so that these, uh, that these electrons now separate from the two atoms, from the two nuclei of the atoms, and that they start orbiting around individual atoms. So in either case, it's going to require this amount of energy that's put in. Now you come with this enzyme, and we're going to show you in a minute how this enzyme works, but the enzyme helps put these two molecules together, or these two substrates, if we're going to make a macromolecule. 
so that at the end we're going to have a product which is going to be one large molecule. Okay, there we go. Likewise, if we start with that one large molecule, we're going to stress the bonds in such a way so that we're going to break it down into two smaller products. Again, in either case, those, that energy is required. Now, we're going to add a, an enzyme to the mix. That's going to be the X here, if my pen works. It's going to reduce the amount of energy because that enzyme is going to help align the, the two molecules together to make one large macromolecule, or it's going to help stress that bond with little or, well, uh, there'll be some energy, but very little energy. So the activation energy with an enzyme will be much less. So, uh, so that means that since it requires less energy, this reaction from, here we go, this point on is going to happen at a faster rate. It's going to be more apt to happen. So if you have an enzyme there, this reaction will occur over and over again. So what you need to know in this slide is what a substrate is. That's the, the uh, molecule that interact with the enzyme. You need to know what the word product is. Product is the end result of that molecule after it's been activated or after it's gone through a chemical reaction in the presence of an enzyme. And you should know what the term activation energy. That's the amount of energy needed to put into the reaction so that the reaction can occur. Okay, I've already told you that these molecules are going to be large and globular. And so this picture sort of depicts that. So if you look at the bottom, right here, this sort of whitish blue cloud is actually a large globular molecule. Look at its shape. Uh, look at it has, it, it's sort of contoured. So all the shades show that it's like the, the surface of a moon. It has a lot of craters, a lot of little hills and whatnot. That's going to be the surface. What it doesn't show you are the different charges. So uh, some um, amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins, some of them are positively charged, some are negatively charged, some of them are neutral. There's no charge. So what I want you to get from this slide is that enzymes are going to be very specific for the substrates that they work on. So here's a substrate in this yellow. Notice that this substrate has also some kind of contour. But as this picture shows down here, that substrate generally is much smaller than the enzyme. So we're going to say that these enzymes are going to be very specific for the types of molecules in which they're going to interact with. These molecules, we're going to call them substrates, they need to interact with this enzyme in a, what we call a lock and key type of model. So that is that the surfaces and the charges of the two molecules have to complement each other. So let me get rid of some of my scribbles here. Okay, so if you notice the surface of this substrate molecule, it has two square ends. These square ends are going to fit in on the specific surface. They're going to sort of form like a glove or that lock and key mechanism. That area or that surface area on the enzyme in which it works on or binds to is going to be called the active site. Now, if, that, <coughs> if another substrate comes along or another molecule comes along and the surface doesn't look like the, the negative image of the active site of this enzyme, it's not going to work. Likewise, if it looks similar as this substrate, but the charges were the same, so that means if it has a positive charge on it and the active sites have positive charges, we know that charges, similar charges repel each other, it's still not going to work. So it needs to have the same or the, the lock and key type surface structures that have to match as well as the charge. That's the basis of what makes these enzymes very specific to the substrates in which they react with. So these enzymes are not going to react with any other molecule but that substrate molecule. So again, in this slide, I've introduced the term substrate. What I've now introduced is the, the new term active site. That's the site on the enzyme. In this case down here, the active site is right here. So all these other grooves and niches, whatever, of this, of this um, protein, have no bearings on how the substrate interacts with this molecule, with the enzyme. So it's this spe specific site here, where that substrate fits in, that is the active site. The term that I didn't mention, but it's when the enzyme and its substrate interact together before a product is formed, 
That is called the enzyme substrate complex. Okay, so now the substrate is interacted with the enzyme, it's formed this complex. What's next? Now let's look at the next slide. Okay, so if you look at this slide, we show, or it shows that there are two substrates. One of them is in red, and the other one's in green. So we're going to take two small molecules, covalently bind them to each other to make one larger molecule. They're going to each have to come together and align each other in a specific way with the aid of that enzyme so that they're going to fill that activation site of this globular enzyme, the, the blue large globular enzyme right here. So now, we, this is where we left on the other slide, we have that enzyme substrate complex. By forming this substrate, that enzyme's forced those two molecules together, it's lowered the activation energy. So we've the substrate, whoops, we didn't make the products yet. So here, the activation site can lower the activation um, energy, and it's going to help speed up that reaction. That means it's going to, to um, guarantee that this next step is going to occur. This next step is where the enzymes, I'm sorry, where the substrates are converted to a product. Notice that the color is not red and green anymore, but it's blue and yellow. That's just to show you that we've changed those two molecules. And actually, I thought, and usually we, we represent it as one large globular uh, product, but what they're just showing is you that the two molecules came together, they were changed. We no longer have substrates. I like to scribble, let me remove my scribbles. We no longer have substrates, but those two molecules were converted into another type of molecule. We call them products. Regardless if they were one large globular protein, I can show them like this, this was um, the red right here, this was the green, and now they covalently bonded. We could have had a product like this, or we could have had two smaller products. Either way, they've changed. They're not the substrates anymore. So this enzyme in step four is no longer needed. So what it's doing is it's releasing the products, and look what we have here. We have the enzyme that is left. Oops, it shouldn't give me that little plus. It should give me an arrow. We have an enzyme that's basically left unchanged. So the point that I want to make is that once the product is made, the product leaves the activation site because it can't make that lock and key mechanism um, anymore, and, and the enzyme is not needed. So the enzyme separates from its product. It can go on and now interact with other substrates if they're present. So this enzyme just basically goes around in a circle. It can work over and over again. The arrow. It can continue this process um, until there's no more substrates left, and what we're going to do is just build on more and more products. Okay, here's just another picture showing the same thing, except the only thing that's different here is that we're not starting out with two substrates, we're only starting with one. And the end effect in number four, or three and four, is where that one substrate has been uh, reduced to two small molecules which we call the products. Again, the products left and the enzyme in green here is, is left to go and react with more substrate. Now so far I mentioned that the enzymes are going to be large globular proteins as shown in this slide as well as in the previous slide. This is pretty much true for many enzymes. This is all that it takes for many enzymes to be um, to be catalysts. However, some other large globular proteins are going to need to have what we call accessories to help make them active. So let's show you that in the next slide. Okay. What I'm showing you in this picture, let me see. Okay, what I'm showing you in this picture is this large globular protein shown in blue. In this case, they've labeled it an apoenzyme. Okay. That apoenzyme is protein in nature. But in this particular case, this enzyme cannot function. It cannot catalyze on its own. So it's going to need some accessory proteins, uh, or I'm sorry, accessories, not proteins. In both cases, they're going to be, or uh, they're going to be non-protein in nature. If they are organic, that means if they have carbon, they're going to be called coenzymes. If they are non-organic in nature, we're going to call them cofactors. So here's a cofactor, right here, this little sort of orange circle. Here's the coenzyme, it's going to be this larger pink area. So 
these accessories, coenzymes and or cofactors, some, some proteins, I'm sorry, some enzymes are going to need one or both. But if they don't have them, imagine if we remove these. Look what the activation site would have looked like. This would have all been void. The activation site or active site is actually this region right here. Now, you can imagine without the coenzymes and cofactors in this place, uh, in this situation, that that active site would look different. It would be missing something. This whole groove would exist and it would not be the active site in which it is recognized. Whoops, also around here. So it wouldn't be the active site that is recognized by its particular substrate. So in this case, this protein, globular protein here in blue, whoops, I lost my drawing tool. Let's bring it back. This large protein is going to interact with non-protein molecules to fill in the void so that the active site can be formed. Now I said that the coenzymes are organic in nature. That's because they're going to have some carbon atoms, but they're not going to be proteins. I also mentioned that the cofactors are non-organic. That means that there won't be any carbon atoms in there. They're usually going to be um, metal ions in nature. So I can say metal ions. Kind of the pen doesn't work. Where's the A? Yeah, metal ions. Sometimes such things as calcium, uh, magnesium, manganese, these all have a double positive charge, the little ions. So there'll probably be a negative charge here that's going to allow the cofactors to bind to, and they're going to fill in that void. Okay, so I've given you an example of a cofactor. What's an example of a coenzyme? The ones that you need to worry about the most are going to be NAD plus and FAD. These are going to come uh, and play a very important role in metabolism. Now, this NAD is short for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, and the structure is shown on the, the right of this word. I'm not going to expect you to know this def uh, the actual word, but I want you to be familiar with NAD. Also, FAD is flavin adding dinucleotide. The molecule structure is a little bit more complicated, and that's shown on the left hand here of the, def of the word. What they both have in common is that they're going to grab electrons. They're going to be electron ex uh, acceptors. So again, they're going to bind. They're going to be coenzymes, so they're going to be this organic molecules shown here in the pink, but they're going to um, also re interact with the substrate that might come to that active site, and they're going to rob that substrate from its electrons. Very important to drive metabolism through. Okay, and here's my slide in which I mentioned again what the cofactors are. They are metal ions, as I mentioned. I told you calcium, manganese, and magnesium. Um, there's also iron, copper, zinc, cobalt. These are all part of your multivitamins that you take. Uh, they also have these metal ions in them. Okay, one more slide, and basically I want to talk about what effects that the environment has on these enzymes. I've told you that these enzymes are proteins in nature, so they're going to be um, affected by the environment um, just like other proteins. So for instance, temperature. Let me get my drawing tool. What does temperature have, what effect does temperature have on proteins? Basically, you've probably learned already that the higher you, you increase, the more you increase the temperature, that the more that these proteins, um, strands of amino acids will unfold. We call that denaturing. So, denature. Where's the A? in nature. Give you an example of what denaturing is. Here's a, I'm going to show the ribbon structure of a globular protein. Here's a strand of amino acids. Now as you increase the temperature, what's going to happen to that strand of amino acids? It's going to basically open up. So remember the importance I told you about that active site? If that active site required this certain folding in the, of the uh, amino acids and the way they came together, if that's the active site right there, 
it is now lost. Where is that active site? It's no longer there. So because the active site was destroyed, this enzyme activity is also destroyed. That is if the temperature goes from, this, this is actually the um, optimum temperature of this enzyme. So if we have enzyme, enzyme activity here on the y-axis, we're showing you the temperature change on the x-axis and approximately at 37 degrees Celsius, that's your body temperature, that's where this particular enzyme has its best activity. So as we heated that enzyme, the activity goes down. That means it's denatured, as I'm showing you here. But what happened here on the left? If you decrease the temperature, that enzyme doesn't really denature, does it? But it just slows down the rate in which molecules come together. So it also has the effect of denaturing that, pro not denaturing, but uh, reducing the enzyme activity. Likewise, pH. What's pH? pH is the measurement of the amount of hydrogen ions that are present in, a, in an environment. So the more hydrogen ions, the lower the pH. The, the less hydrogen ions, the higher the pH. Oops, somehow I magnified that. Let's stop that. Okay, I got it back to the right size. Likewise, pH, by affecting the, the, the charge in the, um, in the environment, the hydrogen ions, those positive charges can interact with the negative charges of the protein, and it could affect, it could also denature that protein, thus the, you have to have a certain amount of hydrogen charge, so a certain amount of pH in the environment. And every enzyme has its optimum temperature, its optimum pH. That's going to add to the diversity of, of different me metabolic reactions that we'll talk about. Now, an enzyme alone will have little enzyme activity. So here's the enzyme alone without any substrate. As you increase the amount of substrate, it's going to start interacting with those substrates to form products. Now, if there isn't a substrate nearby right away, then that reaction will happen very slowly. But the more en substrate that you add into the mixture, as a product leaves the enzyme, another substrate is ready to interact with that enzyme. And at one point, the, no matter how much substrate you add, that reaction won't go any faster. It's going to say it's saturated. It's going to plateau. So the more substrate at one point uh, will not speed up the reaction anymore. So these are the three factors that affect the activity of, your, of enzymes. It's going to be temperature, pH, and substrate concentration. We'll talk about temperature and pH later on when we, can, when we talk about metabolism. So that wraps up our lecture on enzymes. This is going to be the basis of talking about metabolic pathways. We'll talk to you soon.